the one man who most will agree put a chink in Drake's armor when he came to beefing, was once a part of a now-dead rap duo with his brother. Ever since the Virginia Beach duo of older brother Malice, now known as No Malice, and his five-year younger brother Pusha T stopped telling their stories of balancing Pusha T's flash of drug dealer spending sprees with No Malice's repentance for their sins as the clips, which ended with their third album Till the Casket Drops in 2009, fans have been begging for more. It's been 14 years of No Malice being mostly invisible, prioritizing his Christian faith, only releasing two coke-free albums, Hear Ye Him in 2013 and Let the Dead Bury the Dead in 2017. In the same amount of time, Pusha T ramped up his coke references over the course of one EP, two mixtapes, and four studio albums. My Name Is My Name in 2013, King Push, Darkest Before Dawn, The Prelude in 2015, which we've still never gotten a King Push album, the Grammy-nominated Daytona 2018 that led to the epic battle with Drake that many would give Pusha T the win for, and It's Almost Dry in 2022, half produced by Pharrell and the other half by Kanye West. Coming into the industry with the support of their Virginia Beach friends, the super producers The Neptunes, composed of Pharrell Williams and Chad Hugo, who made all the music for their first two official albums and one that was unreleased, the clips had the hottest producers of the early 2000s co-signing and working with them. From the streets to the suburban audience, the clips' sophisticated coke rap appealed to dope boys that related to the dangerous details and lifestyle, but their vivid vocabulary and rhyme schemes also captured the attention of middle-class college kids and fashionable club goers whose paychecks were dedicated to looking as fly as possible every weekend. They made hip hop fall in love with the pricey Japanese streetwear brand of Bathing Ape, better known as Babe, in the early 2000s, and they became the poster boys for the blogger era hype beast sneakerhead generation, or at least one of a couple. With Virginia mostly being known for being home to producers like Timbaland, Pharrell Williams, and other artists such as Missy Elliott, D'Angelo, and Devante Swing from Jodeci, when the Clips released their gold-selling first album, Lord Willen, in 2002, they had virtually no local rap competition to steal their mainstream shine, like more densely populated rap scenes such as Atlanta or Houston. Being that No Malice and Pusha T have never had a public beef and have both maintained that their brotherly bond is tight, what led to the sad death of the Clips? The Clips first got started in 1993 when the Thornton brothers, Gene and Terrence, or Malice and Pusha T, first met Pharrell Williams, one half of the production team, the Neptunes. Pharrell was only two years out of high school, but he had already found success in the music industry under the wing of producer Teddy Riley, who relocated to Virginia from Harlem. As Pharrell and his partner Chad Hugo started taking the clips seriously and built a working relationship with the two brothers, Pharrell assisted the clips in securing a record contract with Elektra Records in 1997, with the Neptunes handling all of the production. This blessing would also be a curse in disguise when it came to Elektra actually releasing the album called Exclusive Audio Footage. There was a music video for the first single, The Funeral, that helped them build up a bit of a fan base. Pusha T describes the song by saying, the funeral was written at a time when a few of my friends had died. It seemed like we were going to an abnormal amount of funerals all at once. I want to say it was probably around like four or so, but they were just really back to back. So we decided to make a song eulogizing ourselves. That's essentially what the funeral was. Two eulogies of myself and Malice. The beat was so dynamic though that it really caused a stir. It was just loud and chaotic, and it sounded like the second line that they do in New Orleans funerals, where they march down the streets. We shot the video with that in mind. But the funeral was considered a commercial failure by Electric, so much so that they left the album on the shelf indefinitely, with it never coming out officially, just many years later in bootleg form. When it was time for a second single, the only thing that would get released from Electra at this point was the clips themselves, when they were dropped from the label. No Malice remembers this moment by stating, Sylvia Rhone signed us to Elektra, but the album didn't go anywhere at the time because at that time, the hot items were Busta Rhymes and Missy Elliott, and all the focus was on them. But I will say, on behalf of Sylvia Rhone, she played fair, didn't keep us around, stuck inside. She could have done that. She liked our talent and felt like we could go somewhere else and get another deal. 
Fortunately for the Clips, Elektra wasn't the end of the road for their career. Their next stop in the music industry was getting signed to Arista Records in 2001 through Pharrell's recently established Star Trek Entertainment label imprint. There were no further delays this time around, with Clips releasing their commercial debut, Lord Willen, the following year on August 20th, 2002. The album made a strong statement, opening at number one on Billboard's top hip-hop albums charts and number four on Billboard's Hot 200. On the strength of the first two singles, Grindin' and When the Last Time, which peaked at number 34 and number 19 respectively on the Billboard Hot 100. The first single, Grindin', might be considered a classic right now. Well, it's definitely considered a classic right now. But back in 2002, it had a slower burn than we might imagine. In fact, not only did it take a long grind to get Grindin' to be a hit, no pun intended, it almost became a Jay-Z song. Pusha T says, I was actually home and Pharrell was in the studio and he called me and he was like, listen, get up here right now. Get up here right now. I've got this record and if you're not up here in 15 minutes, I'm just giving it to Jay-Z. I am. I'm giving it to him. If you're not here in 15 minutes, I know you're home. You're home. You're home. Your house is 10 minutes from here. That means you got five minutes to get ready and get over here. If not, I'm giving it to Jay. I couldn't really deal with that. And I was there. Needless to say, in 13 minutes. It took nine months to break the record. People don't understand that I did every $5,000 show with every drug dealer in the United States of America behind that record. Things start in the streets, and the hustlers of the world resonated with that record so well that they were just booking us. It was an underground cult kind of thing. It was like, come to Detroit, five racks, wear a bulletproof vest, and come to Milwaukee, where you need armed security. And this isn't a radio-driven thing. This is something that's basically brewing in the streets. The third single, Ma I Don't Love Her, featuring Faith Evans, was a modest hit, cracking into the Billboard Hot 100 at number 86. On October 1st, 2002, in less than a month and a half, Lord Willen was certified gold by the RIAA, with a star-studded album that also featured Jadakiss, Styles P, Sean Paul, Fabulous, Lil Wayne, Jermaine Dupri, Nori, Cardinal Official, and Birdman. With that level of success, you'd think that the Clips would be right back with another album the following year. But sadly enough, the second Clips album wouldn't come out for another four years thanks to more record label drama. After earning their proper place in the world of hip-hop with their 2002 debut, Lord Willen, the Clips were gearing up to release their highly anticipated sophomore rap album, which would later end up being Hell Hath No Fury. But soon, the Clips found themselves knee-deep in contractual hell instead. In 2004, the Clips' parent record label Arista Records merged with Jive Records. Being that Clips were signed to Arista through the Neptune's label Star Trek, Clips got jammed up with Jive Records and had to stay there against their will while Star Trek left to partner up with Interscope. Jive was already transitioning into more of a pop music focus and was being accused of not properly promoting rap acts. After Hell Hath No Fury experienced several release date delays, Pusha T and No Malice got so fed up that they filed a lawsuit against Jive pushing for a release from the label, with their major complaint being a lack of promotion. Basically, during the restructuring of Clive Davis's Arista Records in 2004, when it merged with Jive, Arista's artists were split up between Clive Davis's new venture, J Records, and Jive. But Jive wasn't trying to let Clips follow Star Trek over to Interscope and become part of their competition. When it seemed like Jive wasn't going to budge on their stubborn position for Clips to fit into a more commercialized pop box musically, the legal battle continued and wasn't settled until May of 2006, which included a distribution contract for the Clips' re-up gang imprint. Hell Hath No Fury finally hit stores in November of 2006 to nearly universal critical acclaim, with Pusha T still calling it the best Clips album ever. Hell Hath No Fury spawned two singles, Mr. Me Too with Pharrell Williams and Womp Womp What It Do with Slim Thug, Hip-hop magazine XXL gave Hell Hath No Fury a perfect XXL rating, marking it one of only six albums in total that were able to earn that honor up until that point. But when it came to record sales, it was considered a flop compared to their previous album from four years earlier. Hell Hath No Fury only sold a modest 78,000 copies in the first week. In comparison to the 122,000 Lord Willen did four years prior, there seemed to be a disconnect between how loved Hell Hath No Fury was by those that did hear it and the sales reports. 
Could it be that four years was too long of a gap after a hot debut? Did Jive still have a bad taste in their mouth from the clips suing them and maybe drag their feet in marketing or shipping the album properly? Were the clips stuck in that weird time between physical CDs still selling in stores and fans grabbing music for free on the MP3 online bootlegging era? One thing that's for sure is that, in less than a year after the release of Hell Hath No Fury, the clips left Jive Records and took their re-up gang records imprint with them as they signed a five-year 50-50 profit-sharing arrangement with Columbia Records for re-up gang records in October of 2007. During the conflict with Jive, the Clips used the underground mixtape circuit to reinvent themselves under a new name while still contractually obligated to Jive. Following Pusha T's idea to start a crew called Reup Gang with Philadelphia rappers Ab Liva and Sandman, they released a four-part mixtape series called We Got It For Cheap, generating a significant buzz during their dry music period. Pusha T explained the Reup Gang situation by saying, Everything happens for a reason. We put out the We Got It For Cheap series on our own for the streets and that helped keep us visible and build the re-up name as an entity. This time, our manager, Tony Draper, got with Coke general manager Alan Grunblatt to put together an official album with new music and let Coke Records do what they do best. This release gives us something fresh in the marketplace to reward re-up fans while we continue to work on the Clips album. After feeling like the 2008 re-up gang self-titled project on Coke Records was mishandled, the fourth member Sandman decided to leave, stating at the time, when it comes to my music, dog, this is what I love. I'm not trying to be a goddamn architect or nothing, or else I'd put my time into that. When you have a movement like the Reup Gang, something that came out of nowhere that was turned into a cult following, I just don't see how people dropped the ball on the last project. So it didn't make sense for me to stick around if stuff ain't in my best interest. There is no Reup Gang. Before they added me, it was the Clips and Ab Liver. That was it. That's what it's been reduced back to. Naturally, they've got to go around and promote the Reup Gang album now, because it's out. And to be honest, I feel like I don't have to do that. I could be bitter, you know how this stuff normally looks, but I'm a G, Cannon's Inc. is real, and I'm not running around not talking no trash. I'm forever the Inc. or the Reup Gang. The Reup Gang ain't going nowhere, and after I blow, dudes are gonna want to do reunion albums and all that. But right now, no. I feel like they think that the Reup is all from them, the success of it. The follow-up to Hell Hath No Fury that was released through the Clips' new deal with Columbia Records was their third studio album titled Till the Casket Drops that came out in 2009. Although it may have kept up with the Christian references that all three Clips albums have, where it differed was that it was their first album that wasn't 100% produced by the Neptunes, this time sharing the workload with DJ Khalil, Sean CNLV, and Chin and Jetty. They also had their clothing line, Play Clothes in Full Swing, and a promotional mixtape called Road to Till the Casket Drops. But even with singles like Kinda Like a Big Deal featuring Kanye West, I'm Good featuring Pharrell Williams, and Popular Demand, Popeyes featuring Cameron, the album still only sold 62,000 copies in its first month of release, with only 31,000 in the first week. This would be the last full-length album that the clips would record and it would signal Malice leaving the rap industry because, like the chorus of this album's final song, he saw something that, quote, made his life change. On March 6, 2012, Malice announced that he changed to No Malice, more fitting with his strength in Christian beliefs. The announcement was made on Twitter with the video he directed that featured himself viewing himself in a casket in a funeral parlor and walking away. The video opens with many quotes from the Bible, first from Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Then, from 1 Peter 2 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. And Romans 1 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers and Colossians 3.8. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Also, during his downtime from rap, No Malice wrote a memoir about his experiences in the music industry and his exit when he got deeper into the church and closer to God. The book came out in 2011, and much like his album titles, the book title also took its cues from Christianity. It was called Wretched, Pitiful, Poor, Blind, and Naked. 
Then there was a documentary based on his life detailed in the book going from coke rap to salvation called The End of Malice. No Malice is spoken about an older woman who was a neighbor of his who became very instrumental in strengthening his faith in Jesus Christ, stating, That older woman would be Miss Alberta. She's just a very important part of my entire story. I just look at one minute, I'm hanging with a good friend of mine who had just come home from jail. He was tired of being cooped up inside the house because he was on house arrest. One day he said, let's go into the cul-de-sac. He could only go so far. At the right time, here comes this lady who wants to witness to us about Jesus Christ. We weren't trying to hear none of that. We were drinking and probably high or whatever. When I look back on the timing of him saying he wanted to get out the house and we go out and see this lady driving by, God's plan was in full effect even before I knew about it. I can't do without that lady. We talk all the time, pray all the time. She lets me know what's going on in her life. We just have some great fellowship. I love her to death. It was because she didn't shun me. Here's a woman that's coming out. It's starting to get dark. You see three guys hanging out and we're drinking. She could have been intimidated, but she was very bold, very adamant. She relies heavily on her faith. She didn't ignore those three dudes and be like, oh, they're never going to be nothing. She came and took the time out and talked to us and gave us a life-changing message. Another important sign that made Malice become no Malice and steer clear of the street life, and ultimately calling it quits with the clips that he had built his rap career around, was after his manager Anthony Jeezy Gonzalez was indicted for involvement in coke dealing. This is the same ex-manager that Pusha T disses for spilling family business in Vlad TV interviews on Pusha's song Brambleton. One such thing that Pusher may have been upset about during Anthony Gonzalez's interviews was when he claimed that 95% of the clips' drug raps were based on his life. No Malice got a sign from God after Anthony Gonzalez's drug indictment when No Malice was waiting for his brother Pusha T on an airplane, stating, That story, it runs deep. They were picking up all of our friends at different times. I had a friend, he just had a baby. He's wheelchairing his wife who's holding the baby while coming out of the hospital, and bam. They got him. I have another friend. He's driving on the interstate with his girl and his daughter in the car, and the police come crash their car into his to make him pull over. They were coming for everybody. We didn't know who was going to get picked up next. They were kicking in doors and making mamas and wives get on the floor. It was just crazy. When I was on the plane and I didn't see my brother get on the plane, I knew what was up because we never miss flights. We were never late. We're usually calling each other and double checking and all that. I hadn't heard none of that. I'm sitting on the plane and at the very last minute he comes stumbling in the door. I stood up in the middle of the aisle in front of all those people on the plane and I told him, yo, I don't know if you thought I was joking. I don't know if you thought I was playing. I'm letting you know, I ain't doing this no more. Pusha T will have a tendency to hear me but think I ain't listening to all that. I just let him know, in case you didn't hear me the first time, it's a wrap. That was the end of the clips. But will there ever be another chance for a new clips album? Pusha T has been very clear when he's asked that question, time after time, that he's ready to make it happen whenever his brother No Malice agrees to hit the studio. In fact, Pusha has been very instrumental in bringing a few clips moments to fruition over the years. As the president of Kanye West's good music record label at the time, Pusha T and his brother No Malice first appeared again as the clips in a song from the 2019 Kanye West album Jesus is King, on the song Use This Gospel that also featured jazz player Kenny G. Aside from a few concert performances here and there over the years, it was 2022 that seemed like the year that we got the closest to seeing Eclipse reunion, when the brothers made two appearances together. First on Bape fashion brand founder Nigo's album, I Know Nigo, on the song Punchbowl, and then almost a month later on Pusha T's own album, It's Almost Dry, on the very last song, I Pray For You, featuring British singer Labyrinth. Pusha T explained his productive moment between the two brothers by saying, First of all, just being in the studio with him was amazing. Already from Punchbowl, everybody was like, I told y'all his brother was better than him. Like, that's all the conversation is. It's cool, man. It's cool. And when y'all hear this other verse, it's crazy. Like, it's so good. I'm glad we got in to do those two. You know me. I'm pressing for an album. I'm pressing. I mean, he's just chilling. He's not pressing. I do have the, like, little brother, I can ask you to do things thing. So that's how I got these. And it just made sense. You know, the Nego thing, he was there. I was particular about it, being credited as the clips. I just want him to see that. Then, in June of 2023, we all saw pictures of Pusha T and No Malice modeling Louis Vuitton clothing. 
side by side at Paris Fashion Week designed by their close friend Pharrell Williams, who became the menswear creative director of Louis Vuitton. This seemed like a full circle moment. It felt like the clips returned the favor of friendship by supporting Pharrell, the very man who first got them in the music industry in the first place. It was also clear that the demand for seeing the clips back together was not just a trendy fad. It was still a moment fans are clearly waiting for and anticipating, even though it may never officially happen again. Make sure to subscribe for more.